So uh, this is a sad and somber time in the history of the United States of America. Uh, for the fourth time in our history, we are compelled by allega allegations of presidential wrongdoing so serious that we are engaged in an impeachment inquiry. While none of us ran for office to impeach a president, everyone on this stage agrees that we have put in into place a fair series of procedures to govern how this process moves forward. These procedures are guided by the precedent Congress set under previous impeachment. They guarantee protections for the president and his counsel that were not expressly provided during prior impeachments. And they lay out a clear path forward so that the American people can hear firsthand the serious and alarming allegations about President Trump's abuse of power. I'm proud of the resolution we put together. I believe that it will withstand the test of time. I'm proud of the work of the Rules Committee. Um, and, um, and even though it got somewhat contentious last night, I want to say uh, I'm proud of the way all members, Democrats and Republicans, conducted themselves. Uh, there was no live streaming and narration during the <laughs> markup. Nobody stormed the committee. Nobody seized the microphone. Uh, people behave, I think, in a, in a way that is respectful uh, of this institution, and I appreciate the uh, cooperation of Ranking Member Tom Cole and the other Republicans as well. Um, uh, I want to thank all the committee chairs here for their hard work to uncover the truth on behalf of the American people. Uh, this vote is a victory not for not th th this vote is a victory not not for any of us, but on behalf of the of the constituents who sent us here, and who demand that we follow the facts and uphold our oath. I also want to thank the courageous civil servants who have come forward to testify. Uh, so far. Uh, many in contradiction of this administration's attempts to silence them and at great risk to their own career. Let me conclude with this. I truly believe that a hundred years from now, historians will look back at this moment and judge us by the decisions we are making here today. At the end of the day, this, risen, this resolution isn't about Donald Trump. It isn't about any of us. It's about our Constitution and it's about our country. And now I'm happy to yield to the distinguished chair of the Select Committee on Intelligence, Adam Schiff. I thank the gentleman for yielding. This is a solemn day in the history of our country when the President's misconduct has compelled us to continue to move forward with an impeachment inquiry. The resolution today sets out the procedures uh, going forward with that impeachment process. The Founding Fathers understood that a leader might take hold of the Oval Office who would sacrifice the national security, who would fail to defend the Constitution, who would place his personal or political interests above the interests of the country. They understood that might happen. And they provided a mechanism to deal with it, and that mechanism is called impeachment. We take no joy in having to move down this road and proceed with the impeachment inquiry. But neither do we shrink from it. The resolution uh, from the perspective of the Intelligence Committee sets out important procedures for how we may conduct our open hearings. Uh, during the de depositions that we've conducted thus far, we've used a format that we believe very conducive to the fact-finding process. Um, those procedures now will be incorporated into the open hearings in which <clears throat> staff counsel will be permitted for lengthy periods of time to do sustained questioning for up to 45 <coughs> minutes per side. Um, followed by member questioning. Uh, we've used this, I think, to great success uh, for both parties during the course of the depositions, where in the depositions we have alternated one hour for the majority, one hour for the minority, 45 minutes for the majority, 45 minutes for the minority. In those depositions, <coughs> over 100 members have been eligible to participate. I should tell you that notwithstanding those that have complained about lack of access to the depositions, most of the members who have been permitted to attend have failed to attend, have not made uh, use of the availability of attending each and every deposition. But those that have, on both sides of the aisle, have had an equal opportunity to question the witnesses. And indeed, when we move into open session, both parties will have an equal opportunity to question uh, any witnesses that are called. The re resolution will also permit me <coughs> as the chair to release, to begin releasing the transcripts of the depositions. And I think that you will see when those are released um, just what equal opportunity members of both parties have had. We recognize the seriousness of this undertaking. We recognize that we have been compelled by the circumstances to move forward. 
when a president abuses his or her office, when a president sacrifices the national interest, when a president refuses to defend the Constitution, <coughs> and does so for the purpose of advancing a personal <coughs> or political agenda, the founders provided the remedy. I make no prejudgment as to whether um, that remedy will be warranted when we finish these hearings. I will wait until all the facts are put forward. We will undertake this duty with the seriousness it deserves and to the best of our ability. Thank you. And I now yield to the Chair of the Judiciary Committee, Mr. Nadler. Thank you very much. No person, Republican or Democrat, President or anyone else, should be permitted to jeopardize America's security and reputation for self-serving political purposes. No president, no official can demand that an ally of the United States do anything in particular to help his or her political ambitions as a condition of receiving help from our country. If, after a fair and thorough inquiry, the allegations against President Trump are found to be true, they would represent a profound offense against the Constitution and against the people of this country. It is the duty of the House to vindicate the Constitution and to make it crystal clear to future presidents that this kind of conduct, if proven, is an affront to the great public that place their trust in him or her. This resolution that we passed today lays the groundwork for open hearings in both the Intelligence Committee and the Judiciary Committee. The House and the American public must see all the evidence for themselves. The resolution makes clear the ample safeguards in the process that will be given and that will be adhered to. The resolution is necessary to ensure that our constitutional order remains intact for future generations. What we have seen are allegations of conduct on many levels that, if proven to be true, are a challenge to the democratic order, to the democratic norms on which we all depend. We must hand this country to our children with its democracy in as good a shape as when it was handed to us. We simply have no choice because no one can be above the law and we must enforce that. I'll now yield to the Chairman of the <coughs> Foreign Affairs Committee, Mr. Engel. Thank you. I'm Elliot Engel, Chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee. For the last month, we've been working lockstep with the Intelligence and Oversight Committees on this impeachment inquiry. So far, we've seen damning evidence that the President abused his power and jeopardized our national security to help his own political fortunes. He pressed for another round of foreign interference in an American election. It's what the framers feared the most. Today, we've laid the groundwork for the next open phase of this investigation. Moving ahead, the Foreign Affairs Committee will continue to support this effort because we know that the administration's abuse of power resulted in our <coughs> foreign policy being subverted and our diplomats being smeared, sidelined, and harassed. We cannot stand for that. I'm glad that the resolution we passed today will provide for an open, fair process that will allow the American people to hear from witnesses, see the evidence, and understand the troubling story of what the President and his allies did. They deserve to know the facts, and they soon will. Thank you. And now, uh, it's my pleasure to call on Carolyn Maloney, the Acting Chair of the Oversight Committee. Thank you. I, I will be brief. Uh, I have just uh, two points. First, I want to commend my colleagues for their diligent work. This is a very grave matter. As they have shown, we are acting deliberatively, thoroughly, and without delay. Secondly, I want to remind everyone of the words of our beloved former chairman, Elijah Cummings. And quote, he said, we are fighting for the soul of democracy, end quote. 
That is our core mission <coughs> under the Constitution. We cannot uh, allow a president or any president to extort foreign countries into interfering with our democracy. We cannot allow a president to withhold critical military aid that we have in Congress provided in order to counter Russian aggression. And we cannot allow a president to ignore duly authorized subpoenas, withheld <coughs> documents, prevent witnesses from tes testifying, uh, covering up wrongdoing, and obstructing Congress. Uh, this is a fundamental corruption of the Constitution, an abuse of power, and a breach of the oath of office. Thank you, and I yield now to the chairman of our uh, caucus, Hakeem Jeffries. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Congresswoman uh, Maloney. I thank the distinguished chairs for their uh, diligent work throughout this process. This is not a celebratory moment here in the capital city. Uh, this is a solemn moment. It's a sober moment. It's a serious moment. None of us came to Congress to impeach this president or any president. But duty now requires that we investigate the serious wrongdoing that is hiding in plain sight. This is a moment for every single member of the House of Representatives to put principle over party, to put the Constitution above corruption, to put democracy above dereliction of duty. This is not a moment, this impeachment inquiry is not about Democrats versus Republicans. It's not about the left versus the right. It's not about progressives versus conservatives. The impeachment <laughs> inquiry is about right versus wrong. And we have a constitutional responsibility to follow the facts, apply the law, be guided by the Constitution, and present the evidence of wrongdoing to the American people. The impeachment inquiry is about abuse of power. It's about betrayal. It's about corruption. It's about national security. It's about the integrity of our elections. It's about defending our democracy for the people. With that, I think we have an opportunity to take just a handful of questions. Chairman. First row. And any chairman who would like to speak. Um, in light of all the information that you've gotten from testimony from witnesses behind closed doors, are you willing to expand the inquiry beyond the narrow scope of the Ukraine scandal? And are you also able to share any of the witnesses that you would like to testify publicly? Well, the process that has been set forth by Speaker Pelosi from the very beginning <coughs> is that we are operating under an impeachment inquiry umbrella, where there are six committees of relevant jurisdiction uh, that will explore the wrongdoing that exists coming out of 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue and at the end of the process make recommendations to the chair and the Judiciary Committee with a continued focus on the Trump-Ukraine scandal, the abuse of power, the solicitation of foreign interference in the 2020 election. And that inquiry, of course, will continue to be led by Chairman Adam Schiff and the Intel Committee because it relates to a matter of national security. But, but, to, but to expand on your question, <coughs> uh, I'm, we're not going to speculate on that now, but uh, we'll see what happens. Can you, you turn, 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 any witnesses to come before the, the public? We're not going to speculate on that now. Uh, uh, please go to the mic, sir. Now that the resolution has passed, when, when can the American people expect to see open hearings? Might it be as early as the week after that? That you should really ask Chairman Schiff, and uh, it depends on, 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 on the, speed of, with which, the speed with which things go there, and I, I can't answer that question. How crucial is John Bolton's testimony to tell I'm, I'm, building the public case that you hope to build against President Trump? Again, you should ask Chairman Schiff that, uh, but um, obviously any testimony is very important testimony, especially from someone so 
so located, so crucially located. Chairman, um, you say that you have the right to impose appropriate remedies if you determine that the president is unlawfully blocking witnesses. What do you mean by that? Well, it's, it's, it's elementary that where one party to a litigation uh, unlawfully blocks uh, the, the investigation, as this president has been doing, although we hope he won't continue doing it, you may have to take some steps. So we may have to draw adverse inferences. We may have to do other things. We'll see. What kind of punishments are you considering? I'm not considering anything at the moment. We'll see what, what happens. Very well. Tell me. Um, how do you interpret the uh, way Republicans voted this morning and the fact that two Democrats voted with them on the resolution? Uh, I, I interpret that the Republicans are, are ignoring uh, <coughs> evidence that they don't want to see uh, a proper investigation. Uh, uh, period. That's all I can draw. Last question. Last question. Uh, a couple of questions for the It's okay. Go ahead. Then, um, first of all, Chairman Nadler, how long do you believe House Judiciary will need once you receive reports? And obviously, I think it's important for the American public to understand the timeline here, if at all possible. And then, for all of you, you all supported this bill, which sorry? has, uh, for everyone on here, um, this bill has more ability for the President once this reaches the Judiciary Committee than the Intelligence Committee. That's something that Republicans have a problem with. Why have those different abilities for the President in Judiciary than Intelligence? Well, your first question was the timeline. Yeah. I don't know. We don't know. It, 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 depends, on, it depends on, obviously, how many witnesses, et cetera. I, I can't speculate on that. The second question is, remember, the, the, the Intelligence Committee is doing a, a basic investigative job, a job that in past impeachments was done by, by, by the Star Commission or by the Urban Committee, et cetera. Once it goes to judiciary, it's a different stage. And uh, it's, a more, it's a different stage. It's not the <coughs> initial fact-finding stage. And it's proper that uh, uh, the President uh, have, 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 have more, more uh, recourse at that point. Now, remember, the minority, the Republicans, have the same rights and <coughs> have, have rights to call witnesses, to, uh, uh, to, to examine witnesses, et cetera, in intel. They will have the same rights in judiciary. <coughs> but once it gets to judiciary, uh, if we're carrying on an impeachment, uh, if, there's, if there's been a recommendation uh, f uh, for an impeachment, and we're carrying on that uh, that investigation, that inquiry at that point, then the president ought to have more rights than in the initial fact-finding stage. President yesterday directed his Republican defenders to focus on substance. That's what House Democrats have been doing from the very beginning, and we invite our Republican colleagues, pursuant to the direction of the president to do the same. What is this all about? Congress, on a bipartisan basis, allocated $391 million to Ukraine in military and economic assistance because we deemed it in our national security interest. Ukraine right now is under attack from Russian-backed separatists. Ukraine is a friend, Russia is a foe. Ukraine is a democracy, Russia is a dictatorship. The United States may very well be the only thing standing between Vladimir Putin and Ukraine being completely overrun by Russia as part of his fantasy to reconstruct what he views as the glory days of the Soviet Union. In that context, Congress allocated the $391 million in a bipartisan fashion. In February, the administration wrote to Congress and said the aid is on the way. But it never showed up. And then in May, the Trump, just, the Trump Department of Defense wrote to Congress again and said the aid is on the way. <coughs> And in that letter said, all necessary preconditions have been met by the new Ukrainian government, including the implementation of anti-corruption protocols. That was in the letter that was sent by Trump's Department of Defense in May. And yet the aid never showed up. Twice during the summer, 
Mitch McConnell called up the Trump administration and said, where's the aid? Mitch McConnell couldn't get a good answer. And then on July 18th, at the White House, the Office of Management and Budget holds a meeting. Mulvaney is there, apparently, where they say the reason the aid has not been released is at the explicit direction of the President of the United States of America. On July 25th, one week later, we understand why. His own words, do us a favor, though, pressuring a foreign government to target an American citizen for political gain and thereby solicit foreign interference in the 2020 election while withholding this aid from a vulnerable Ukraine. Mr. President, that's the substance of the matter. That's what we're going to focus on moving forward. Thank you. And let me, and let me, let me add to that and say that um, foreign aid uh, is, is a very important uh, component of what, of what we do around the world. Uh, in order to, to keep uh, America really at the, at the top of the world. And the money that the Congress allocated for foreign aid was not the President's personal piñata that he can use however he wants. By withholding that money, he's taking an asset of the United States, not a personal asset of the United States, and withholding it to try to coerce the leader of another country to help him in his political election. I mean, if, if, if that isn't crazy, then I don't know what is. So this really just cannot stand. Foreign aid is not the president's personal piñata to do what he wants with it. Uh, the Congress appropriates it. And Ukraine is in a, a very uh, imp important crossroads right now. And so this is a very, very serious matter. It's not simply a matter of the president talking to a leader of a foreign country. It's a matter of taking American money that the Congress allocated for foreign aid for a country to withhold it and say to that leader, I'm not going to give it to you unless you do what I need you to do. That is an absolute disgrace. And that's one of the reasons we're here. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Somebody's Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs>